Hi, everybody. Thank you for being there this morning. Uh, well, today I, I will present you a bit of what we do, but mostly of what has been done using LCMS. Uh, I think it will, it will be fun for, for most people here to hear about what, what has been going on with LCMS during the COVID uh, and, and what we also have done for, for this. Uh, so uh, I, I will present who we are. So Fino Switch is a Canadian CRO. We are based in Sherbrooke, Quebec, a little bit south from uh, Montreal, uh, near the border of the US. Uh, we provide high quality LCMS and services. Uh, we, we, we want to be kind of a one-stop shop for anything related to LCMSMS, but we, we have a very uh, great experience in proteomics and other omics as well. So, so that's our main expertise and, and, and what we, we like uh, a lot to do, but we, we have other expertise as well, all related to LCMSMS. Uh, our values are around innovation, so we spend a lot of time uh, developing new workflows, improving them. We, we, we don't like be doing things like, like everybody does, so we, we like to improve things. Our way of doing things is a lot in collaboration. Uh, we like to uh, implement uh, agile ways of doing things, so we like to work with the client. We, we know that you have the science for your project. So we, we try to get you involved uh, in the decision making and bring you early results so we can elaborate and, and uh, improve the, the final data report. We try to keep things very simple. Uh, that, that's one thing that, that we value a lot. And we um, uh, imply a lot of quality checkpoints uh, because we know that when you work with a CRO, uh, you want to be in confidence with the data you receive, so we, we, we take great care of, of looking at the quality of what we produce. So we are sole tenant of a 5,000 uh, 5, square feet uh, facility, uh, more than 25 year experience in academia, biopharma research, five PGs, two MSCs, one baccalaureate, uh, two lab tech, and th those numbers are actually moving right now because we, we are recruiting and implementing new, new staff in the team. Uh, we have a four mass spec installed, three QTA from SciX, and one LCMS triple quad from Shimadzu for anything that's related to targeted quantification. So all those our instruments are high end uh so we 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 like to have the the, the ferrari installed in our lab um a bit of my background so why covid and sars is interesting for me uh as a scientist at first so during my phd i had the chance to work on a family of enzymes that are involved in the activation of different toxin of different viruses uh, including sars uh, influenza H5N1, uh, Shiga toxin. Uh, those are the papers that I've published. And also those uh, family of enzymes have a role in the immune system. So having the cytokine storm, cytokine, cytokine storm produced by COVID-19 is something I've worked uh, on it during my PhD. So it's very interesting uh, subject for me. Um, so today's goal, uh, a little bit of fun with the COVID-19 publication so far, uh, just to highlight uh, what, what it says. Uh, I will bring some highlights on the COVID-19 uh, uh, publication that use of CMSMS. Uh, and I will present our, our current effort, uh, short word on that, on, on the development of models to study long-term effect of COVID-19 and also what we have previously done using LCMS to study uh, an important viral gain uh, that's related to the O-cell uh, endoproteases. So let's start with the publication. So those are numbers are dating a little bit back, back so there, there, there may be those, those are, have mostly increased uh, since I did those uh, small data mining. If we look at uh, the number of publication and what they are related to uh, in terms of keywords, uh, most of the publication are related to inflammation and genomics. 
Uh, that said, genomics publication are mostly related to the virus genomics itself, not to the, the patient genomics. Uh, a lot of paper around inhibitions because that's what people are trying to do. And if you look at the, the more scientific words like transcriptomic, proteomics, single cells, uh, mass spectrometry, there's less uh, publication related to that. So I did a small uh, uh, text mining approach on the abstracts themselves to see what those abstracts tell. Uh, and unfortunately, they, they don't tell much. <laughs> So the, the scientists around the world needs to improve their abstracts because right now they tells you that uh, COVID-19 is a disease uh, that causes severe health issues. So that's it. So it's not nothing novel. Uh, and abstracts uh, seems tends to repeat what you see on Facebook or, or LinkedIn publications. Um, but if we... Uh, Focus. Uh, so, so we focus on the titles. I use the ten thousand last titles themselves. Once again, well, the, the titles themselves uh, they, they are uh, actually not very informative, mostly broad. So that tends to uh, indicate that most of those publications were most likely reviews or case or just uh, ideas about COVID nineteen, but not much about the research themselves. So I decided to dig down and filter for. Uh, titles where there was proteomics and genomics in, inside the titles. And, and you could see that for the genomics, it's mostly related to, like I mentioned earlier, to the viral, uh, uh, you see the, the word phylogenic analysis. So you see the viral uh, evolution, uh, but you can still see some potential therapeutic target uh, inside those keywords. So that means that the genomic was uh, used to identify new targets. And if you look at the proteomics, uh, you see the keywords there. Uh, well, you, you see profiling, systematic review, okay. But uh, looking at the respiratory syndrome itself, so looking at the receptors, uh, looking at, at more uh, uh, functional uh, things. So that's uh, what is interesting about mass spectrometry. Most of the time it's used for uh, understanding what's going on on a model. So a few highlights of great publication that has been published so far. And the aim of, of bringing that to your attention is that a lot of people uh, sometimes are afraid of mass spectrometry, of proteomics, but, but when it's used the right way, it can deliver a lot of information that, and when the, that information is treated the right way, it can give you very, very insightful information for your uh, target drug discovery and, and so on. So those two articles were very similar, uh, most likely mostly related to uh, metabolomic and proteomic uh, characterization of uh, patient sera. And the aim was to find new targets and, and they, they have very nice results around that. So if we take uh, the one on the upper left, uh, you see that at the end, they were able to identify a correlation uh, with the viral transcription and the protein transcription with some very specific pathways where there is a drug that could be repurposed. So that's a, a very uh, innovative way of, of finding a, a mentiviral uh, with a drug that's already uh, approved. So to speed up the, the development of, of uh, antiviral for the coronavirus. Uh, a similar uh, study, in that case, they use an affinity purification of viral proteins and to see what are the host proteins interacting with the viral proteins uh, and to see if it could use that as an antiviral strategy. Uh, once again, they were successful. Uh, they found uh, very, very uh, interesting targets where there were already several drugs that could be repurposed. Uh, you see here metformin, uh, it's, it's something that is uh, already widely used. So it's, it's very interesting uh, to, to use those kind of strategies. I don't know where they are, are at right now in, in those repurposing uh, uh, initiatives, but, but uh, I think it's very interesting when you have a model that you, you don't know yet uh, what to do with uh, and, and or a very nice target. It's very interesting to 
uh, look at those interactors and see if there would be something that is already uh, been approved to, to work with. Uh, another uh, study that has been published, and, and this one is something that I, I like a lot, uh, doing those multiomic uh, studies and to classify patients. Uh, and it's very important because if you think of that right now, yes, we know that elder people will, will most likely have severe symptoms when they are infected with COVID-19, but in the younger age, class of, of, uh, of the population right now is very difficult to differentiate between someone that will have the disease or someone that will have the disease plus complication. So in that paper, they did some uh, simple SERA uh, analysis and they were able to build a model to successfully classify uh, patients uh, be between uh, the severity. Uh, the only, I would say, uh, the only uh, pitfall in that study is that the model itself is good to look at their own data set right now, uh, which is quite obvious at some point. Uh, but in the paper, they mentioned that they wanted to, uh, let's say, test drive that model on a larger number of samples to be able to see if the model can be translated and help uh, patient classification. Uh, the other thing that uh, has been put some efforts on it is the use of the mass spectrometry itself to uh, replace the QPCR assays where, where there's so much polemic around it sometimes. Uh, there, there's a paper, the, and, and actually uh, there's a company that has published a panel of peptides that could be used uh, for targeted quantification of spike and nucleal protein of the virus. Uh, the, the, the essay itself is more specific than the actual uh, QPCR essay, which is good, but the problem here is the cost and time for simple preparation and, and bring it, it into a high throughput uh, essay that would be as fast as the QPCR, uh, we are not there yet. Uh, but still it could be a nice uh, add-on to validate some test results from the QPCR uh, after positive results are, are returned. Uh, another group has used a more uh, high throughput uh, way of doing this using Malditoff. There's no digestion or preparation mostly involved. Uh, the only problem is that if you look at the table two here, uh, the accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity of the method is not very good yet. So there, there will be much more work to do on, on that uh, essay to, to make it uh, to the clinical. Um, and what is upcoming? So there, there's been a, one paper here that used GCMS in that case to uh, actually, it's a breather. So they, they use the VOCs uh, of, the, uh, of the patients to uh, look at what is uh, there in, that, in those VOCs and, and differentiate between an infected and uninfected patient. Uh, and Shimadzu just released, uh, it was a few days ago, uh, a collaboration uh, with, a, with a biotech to you do a direct breath analysis a system that will collect the, the, uh, the breath. And in five to 10 minutes, they, are, they, are, they will be able to analyze the vapors, uh, the proteins and the metabolites that are there. And the system will be able to judge if it's infected or not, and also the risk uh, or not of aggravation. Uh, still, they, they claim that they would be able to do that uh, till the mid-July uh, or January, uh, June next year. Uh, but the, the idea is to put some effort for the future uh, of viral detection, infection detection. Uh, so, so that's the, the few technologies that have been published. So uh, that, that's it for the, the review of what MASPIC has, has done during the COVID-19. Uh, the next um, part of the presentation will be about uh, what we are doing right now uh, as a CRO, uh, what we are wor working on uh, right now to help the, the study and, and the, oops, the, uh, the improvement of the patient health. So uh, a lot of things have been done right now in looking at uh, antibodies, looking at the vaccines to stop the virus. Uh, Few have started to look at the short-term effect uh, of the infection. 
but still we have a lot uh, to do for the long-term effect of the virus infection, but still we can build on what has been done on SARS and MERS and, and know that there will be some uh, long-term effect. And one of those long-term effect is uh, lung fibrosis. Uh, we, we've started a collaboration here in Sherbrook with uh, IPS Therapeutics we are uh, expert in build, building models uh, to study uh, pre, uh, preclinical models to study drugs. And they, they have and they are developing several models of fibrosis, inclu including lung fibrosis. Uh, and, and one of the problems with lung fibrosis is that it lacks of clear biomarkers for decision making. Uh, and most of the decision uh, is based on the histology analysis. So uh, it's very difficult to differentiate one drug to, the, to another. It's very difficult to differentiate uh, a drug that will behave differently in terms of uh, disease uh, progression uh, to another. So uh, the question was uh, what and how proteomics and metabolomics could improve the decision-making in uh, the study of fibrosis. So that's what we started. Uh, it's very fresh, uh, I would say, as results. But I will present you a, a, a few a few things we have right now. Uh, so, if we compare the sham, so the control, with the uh, 24 plus injection of fibrosis, uh, and we look at the balls, so branco alveolar uh, washes. Uh, and we end up having a, a very high increase of the complement pathways. Uh, and this is well known. So complement has been associated with fibrosis for, for a while. Uh, if we look at the, just to understand what this is, this is the pathway itself, the interaction, the line or the interaction between the proteins. Uh, the name here are the protein names. So C3 being the, probably the, one of the first in the cascade activation cascade here and blue being low and red being high and the border being the p-value. So uh, greener it is, uh, higher is the p-value. Right now we don't see it very well, but it should be green. <laughs> um, so I put the p-value a little bit high because it was a first test with the N of three with uh, animal models. So we have a lot of variability right now, but we are working on that. But this result was a little bit interesting because uh, if we were changing the peptide we were uh, using to quantify the protein. So when we do proteomics, we first digest the proteins with an enzyme and we use the peptides to quantify the protein. So if we were changing the peptide we, we were using, we were obtaining quite different results than that. So uh, there was a question here, what, what's happening? So we, we looked, for example, at C3 uh, and, and what we monitor on C3 and the level. So we clearly see there on, on the left is the total, uh, total intensity of the peptides. And there, uh, on the bottom there, you have the position of the amino acid. So I've actually truncated the, the protein in two different segments. So the protein C3, when it's cleave and activated would release C3A, C3A that is uh, an anaphylotoxic peptide. And if we look at after induction, you see that there's an increase of the protein, but if you look at this segment here, it, it's not much increased. So, so that's very interesting. And the other thing that if you look at the N terminal of the protein and the C terminal protein, you have a different ratio. So that was a little bit puzzling. So what's happening? And we know that this protein has several cleavage sites and several post transcriptional processing that will probably affect which peptide we see. So right now, what we realize is that the standard proteomic workflow is not good enough for uh, to grab the information, the correct information of those models especially when there's enzymatic cascade and several PTMs, we need to look at a more peptide-centric analysis and also look, for example, in those cases, uh, at the activation, what is the state of the protein? And we have a workflow for that. So we are able to monitor the end terminal of the, the different uh, cleavage site, and we are working also on implementing a C terminal. So we will be able to have a full information of how the protein are, are they cleave, 
and, and look at every peptide and instead of looking at protein levels more looking at the peptide levels because the peptide levels will give us information about the protein structure itself so that's what we are working on we are working on implementing those with proteomic and metabolomic for a bunch of fibrosis models uh, and, and hopefully it will help uh, developing new drugs to help patients that will develop the fibrosis after COVID-19 infection. Um, the other thing we've done, and this, this uh, you see the, the change of the, the, the presentation, this dates back from a while ago because that, those are things I've done during my PhD and I've continued doing those uh, essays the, during, uh, with the company as well after. So if you look at uh, how the virus work and how the virus enter the cell, so you would have the glycoprotein. In that case, this is the influenza uh, HA glycoprotein that is on the surface of the virus. The, the protein will interact at the cell surface of the cell, but there's an activation site here that needs to be cleaved in order for the protein to change the conformation and then uh, initiate the membrane fusion. And in some viruses, there's an important gain of function that, that is a multi-basic uh, site that will be cleaved by other enzymes than, than the, what the, the, the virus is used to, to be cleaved. So this site can be recognized by a family of protein on which I've worked during my PhD that are the proprotein convertase. The furin is one of the most known uh, of those enzymes. And it's ubiquitously expressed in all tissues. So what it does is that when you have this, it means that the virus can enter not only the lung, but all the tissues in the body. Uh, if you look, for example, at, at uh, different, uh, where are those proteins and how it works. So you see that most of the surface trypsin-like uh, endoprotease that are used for the spike cleavage for the, the coronavirus are on the cell surface. And usually the, the, the virus will be expressed, not cleaved. But when furin, the, there's, it's, it's not fully true here. So when furin is the, the, the enzyme that will cleave, instead of being cleaved during the endocyt endocytosis, it will be most likely uh, expressed and released already activated. So that's a main difference. So the virus is much more potent because of that, but also we'll be able to enter other part of the body because of that as well. Even though that if, if furin is not there, it will still be able to infect the cells. Uh, and if we look at this multibasic cleavage site, we see that we have the SARS-CoV-2, we have the SARS-CoV, and, and you see that there, this gain of function is there. And, and more, more importantly, you, you have actually two cleavage sites on the, on the spike protein that can be cleaved by furin uh, based on, on prediction. So that's, that's one of the problems you have with SARS-CoV-2. It's not only uh, cleaved by the trypsin-like. Uh, so why I, 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 I'm telling you about this is because it's something that must be studied. And if you want to, for example, target the also proteins uh, and inhibit them as a, a drug target, you need to understand why and how it's cleaved and where it is. So how you do that? So you can do some co-expression, co-localization using immunofluorescence, but it's still indirect. Uh, you can do some prediction and in bioinformatics, uh, but right now, most of the model for uh, enzyme cleavage are not that good. Uh, you can do some direct analysis using Western blot. Uh, it's, it's good for in vivo and in vitro, but it's very low throughput. And you can do some direct peptide cleavage assays. Uh, but for those direct peptide cleavage assays, the common way of doing this is to use a FRET uh, assay, for example. Uh, the problem with the FRET assay is it's quite long to develop, but also you are kind of limited in, in the length of peptide you can use. And the length of the peptide is very important because if you look at the, the peptide themselves and how they vary, it's very important to have all the information before and after. And this peptide is a little bit, peptide is a little bit long uh, for FRET. It could be possible, but it would be a little bit difficult to, to develop. So the way we used to do it is by HPLC. 
So we were just incubating and by the incubation, we were able to monitor KM and VMAX. So affinity and capacity of the enzyme to cleave the, 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 the site. The other thing is that if you look at the 3D structure, this peptide is, is also kind of, uh, it's, it's known to be kind of fluffy uh, by, based on the our NMR uh, studies, but still there, there's some kind of structure in it. So you, you need to have something that is quite big to represent how the enzyme behave with the, the peptide. So we used to do it by HPLC, but this is a representation. It, it, it was like 60 minutes. Uh, runtime, we could have improved it by U UPLC, but if you want to look at the separation of all those peptides, uh, you need to play a lot on the gradient. So the idea was to translate that into LCMS. And with LCMS, we had another gain of information where we could actually sequence the, the, the cleavage and where it cleaves actually. So using LCMS, we, we could actually lower the acquisition time to 2.5 minutes and probably we could do it even faster uh if we in that case we because we we did it because that way because it was fast enough for for now but we could do it uh, by direct infusion probably without problem uh and we were able to translate that uplc uh, hplc uh, essay into lcms and speed up the uh the speed of analysis but also identify the exact cleavage site so this is an example of what we've done with an enzyme uh, of interest. Uh, we did determine first the, the key M, the Vmax of the, the enzyme uh, on, the, on the standard peptides. So to determine at which concentration we will incubate the enzyme with the peptide because we wanted to monitor both capacity and affinity. So there's a big difference between both. So affinity is the capacity to, of the enzyme here you see to bind to a specific sequence. So the colors are a different sequence of uh, spike proteins. And you see, for example, here, you have a quite high affinity. So even though that the virus it would be there at a very low level, the, the enzyme will still be able to bind here. But here on the green on the left, uh, there's no affinity at all. So that means that if there's a low level of the virus, the, the enzyme will not be very important. If you look at the capacity, however, so the, 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 the enzyme here is able to still cleave uh, the, the, the site. So that means that a later stage of the infection where the viral load is higher, this enzyme could be important as well. So uh, that is important for what? Because we tested actually uh, four different enzymes in that assays. And you could see that there's quite a different profile between enzymes and between different peptides. So if your aim is to target also proteases uh, to stop the viral uh, propagation, you need to be careful a little bit on which target protease you target uh, because some are important at the beginning and some are important at the end of the infection uh, and what would be the timing of your treatment. Otherwise it may fail because if you're not able to uh, block it at the right time, there will be some most likely another protease that will uh, act as a backup plan for the virus. Uh, and we were also able to look at the different enzymes and where they cleave. So we see that it's, it's, it's not a clear cut uh, and we could probably do some kinetics on when they appear, but some enzymes are a little bit more, uh, I would say loose on where they cut on the on the peptide of the virus. And this maybe is because we are in an in vitro model with synthetic peptides. And if we will go on, on the in vivo model with the virus itself, it will change because of the structure. Uh, the good thing also about LCMS is all those workflows are, can be translated uh, into in vivo. So we have a workflow to monitor uh, enzymatic cleavage in vivo. So we can use that and then just take the information we gain here and look at those into tissues or, or cell lines as well. So those, those are the things we have done for COVID-19. Uh, so in conclusion, well, LCMS can provide rapid and meaningful insights on a disease or, or a disease model. Uh, it's, it's a lot uh, complementary to transcriptomic and, and genomic where we, well, we know and there's an increasing number of publication 
uh, that present that, that looking at the gene expression itself is not enough. You need to look at the protein, but also sometimes, like I presented in the fibrosis, looking at protein expression itself is not enough. You need to look at the state of the protein itself. Um, uh, I, the mass spectrometry can, can maybe a new key for uh, infection detection, but still uh, based on, on what I presented in, in the early publication we have on that, it's some work, some work uh, needs to be done uh, to be able to, to do that in as fast as the qPCR assays. Uh, so that's our uh, motto. So let's elevate your research together. Uh, we are expert mass spectrometry services. Uh, I would be glad to speak with you about your projects and also we'd be glad to take your question on the, on the matter of COVID-19 and mass spectrometry. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Hugo. There is a question for you from Manuel. Um, he's asking, have you shared your data results with agency, government agencies looking at ways to tackle COVID? Uh, for for the for what I've done during my my PhD, uh, my my former PI has deposit with collaborators. Uh, uh, LOI uh, in that matter uh, to to use uh, inhibitors that they have developed. Uh, yes, not not myself because I'm I'm not the owner of of all that intellectual properties. But uh, yes, it, it's it has been done, and and I know that there's several groups that that start working on the also protease as target. But like I presented there, it's uh, I would say it's uh, maybe a challenging task, but it's possible. And that was Hugo. And yeah, and if you are interested in connecting with him and his team, um, you could always use our meeting scheduler platform or email myself, Victor, Sherry, or the rest of our team, and we can connect you with Hugo and his other colleague, Jean Philippe. Um, and um, yeah, he will also be the uh, panel moderator later today at 4 p.m. Uh, make sure you stick around for that panel. Um, him and the other panelists will be discussing deep diving into drug discovery outsourcing in 2020 and how COVID-19 has changed the research landscape. So he'll be joined by almost 10 other panelists from the industry. Um, so be sure to stick around for that as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Hugo, for your presentation. Thank you.